morning. 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 Well, time for us to get started this morning. We've got a few announcements. Um, don't forget the Fort Murray Day sign up sheet is on the back. We'll be volunteers there to, uh, to man the booth. Just like two hour shifts or one hour shift, whatever you can do. But we need, uh, we need some. Uh, some people to sign up for that. That's next Saturday, so uh, anyway, but that's a, that's a good work, and we'll hand out some handouts, and talk to people about God, and, and uh, try to grow His kingdom. Uh, hot luck today, so uh, if, you, if you're here visiting, just, we usually have uh, tons of food, so stick around and enjoy the pop-up with us. We can uh, get to know you. Uh, I know we've been praying for Mitch, and he's here today, so praise God for that. Amen. Uh, he, I know he looks like my older cousin, but he's my younger cousin. So. <laughs> <laughs> but we have several uh, that have asked for prayers this morning, so... Uh, Jason's going to write these down. He has to open prayer, but I'm going to give them. Uh, Bonnie and Angela are asking for prayers for them and uh, their baby. Uh, everything will go well. It's has having some. He gave me the name. It's a long name for a hole in the heart. But anyway, it, we'll pray that God's will that it'll heal up on its own and everything will be. Uh, it's going. There, and was going down for a echocardiogram echo echo next week. So be uh, be praying that everything goes well there. And uh, Elaine's nephew Carlos was involved in a, a car pedestrian accident. I guess maybe it was his fault. So anyway, she's asking for prayer for Carlos <coughs> and the pedestrians that were hit, and, and everything will work out for that. So remember to be praying for uh, Carlos and the, and the people that were were hit. Um, Jesse needs our prayers. So be asking for prayers for Jesse. He's having difficulties and. Just want the doctor to find out what's going on with Jesse and, and be able to just stop stop that and heal him and, and uh, just come to them. And we just uh, pray for that. Um, I haven't heard any other on Cassandra. I know they were going to induce labor, and I haven't heard anything other than Saturday night. It hasn't happened yet. So. At 6:30 this morning, you text me. So this morning they're still waiting. So be praying for uh, BJ and Cassandra that everything will go well. Be God will that that baby will be born soon. Uh, anything I missed? Okay. The, the reading this morning is going to be from Second Thessalonians. And uh, I'm doing Dominic's work this morning. This morning. He said this would be part two. I get part of his wages. Second <laughs> uh, Thessalonians 1, and we'll uh, read the whole chapter. No groaning, it's really short. Uh, starts out greeting Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you brothers as is right because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in all the afflictions that you are enduring. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, 
for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless the reading of his word. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Our first song this morning is number 719-719. Love one another. <laughs>
that you are our Lord, that you created all of this for us, and that your will is so good, and we just need to have more faith. We always need to be increasing our faith. Every day it should be growing. We're so thankful for this opportunity that we have that we can gather together and, and be as one and, and lift you up and <coughs> be able to worship you together. We're just so thankful for that. We're thankful that we can do so without being persecuted. And we pray for those that are in other places that, that are afflicted and, and punished because of you. We ask that we never become complacent. We have special prayers for Jesse and help him to overcome the issues that he's having and just be with him and just we ask you to be with the, the two babies that haven't arrived into this world yet that are still growing and, and they both have problems and we just ask you to be with Lonnie and Angela Help it to grow out of the heart defect and just help it to come out a healthy, beautiful baby. Also, we ask for Cassandra and DJ baby that it will be delivered safely and, and, and again be just a healthy, beautiful baby. Thinking of you when a new life comes into this world, you're such a, a grand creator of all things, and we just just want your will to be done, and that we can glorify in that. We also ask that you be with uh, Elaine's nephew Carlos and, and the two others that were involved. In Your will be done in this matter, and, and that hearts will be softened and, and help that, that those that are injured that they can overcome. And again, we're, we're just so thankful for, for you and, and your strength that you give us. I ask that. Continue to be with Dan and Ruth and, and help them to overcome what he's going through. Be, be there with Kathy and, and Eddie as they're, they're dependent on him. We're always asking that your will be done, that no matter what happens, that your good will be seen. have evidence of your of you everywhere. Evidence is what people always are looking for and your truth cannot be denied. You have to make up things to deny your truth. Help us to be that humble servant 
according to you. And share your love to others. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
chapter 15. All right. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which you also receive, and in which you stand, by which you are also saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. You know, Jesus gave us this, this command that we would come together on the first day of the week, and that we would remember this gospel as he willingly came to the cross to pay for our sins, that he did it in obedience to the Father, and that we so likely would, in obedience to him, come together on the first day of the week to remember the sacrifice he made on that cross as he paid for our sins. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as I stand up here today and look amongst all the people that have all gathered here in your name, I, I stand up here with a humble heart and full of a sadness that is unexplainable because of what you did for us. You gave us an unmerited favor. You know, it's through your grace that we've been saved as long as we fall into your blessed commands. And Lord, uh, Romans 3.23 says that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it's your grace that saves us. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. And the wages are payment, your payment, the price that you paid for us that we should have paid all along. Your body was broken as you hung there on the cross. And you did so sad as well, and also with joy, save, doing so to save and wash away our sins. And it's such a blessed day to be able to be here and just give thanks for all that you have done for us, Lord. And as we partake of this bread, I ask that we do so in a manner that is pleasing unto you. And it is in Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs>
also like to like to be given to us to the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask Father that you bless this and bless it. Those who protect this cup in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Ephesians 2 8, Paul writes, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of yourself, it is the gift of God. You know, here, here we have this opportunity. You know, as we just remember the grace, the unmerited favor, this gift that we don't deserve, that God gave us, we can understand the heart of God. And if we're going to be like God, we've got to have that same heart in the gift the means that we have, that we deem necessary. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful for the gift that you've given us, Lord. And as we uh, prepare to give here, Lord, and follow in the year that, Lord, that, that we would give from the heart, that we would give cheerfully, and that we would give abundantly as we've been given. Lord, that you would use these monies to further grow and strengthen your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 the lesson this morning, let's sing 610, 610. 
And at this time, if we have any young people between the ages four and 10, you're invited to go to the back of the auditorium and then go next door for your children's Bible hour. And you're already standing, so <laughs> I appreciate that. 610. Jesus, my heavenly King, must be I know. Praises to him I sing, onward I go. Closing to him I cling, blessings still flow. I love my Savior too. I love my Savior. He loves me too. I seek his favor in everything I do. Walking with Lot's wife. And it's us 
needing to go in and, and realize why did God kill Lot's wife the way that he did, the specific way that he did. So let's begin looking at Genesis chapter 19, and we're going to start in verse 12. Then the two men, who are angels disguised as men, these are angels that have come to Sodom to see if it's as bad as, as God has heard account of and to get Lot and his family out of there because God already obviously knows that it is as bad as he has seen. These two angels disguised as men said to Lot, Whom else do you have here? A son-in-law and your sons and your daughters and whomever else you have in the city, bring them out of this place. For we are about to destroy this place, because their outcry, the sinfulness of Sodom, has become so great before the Lord, that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Lot went and spoke to his sons-in-laws, who were to marry his daughters, and said, Up, oh, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he appeared to his sons-in-laws to be jesting. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, oh, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated. So the two men seized his hands, and the hands of his wife, and the hands of his two daughters. For the compassion of the Lord was on him, and they brought him out and put him outside of the city. When they had brought them outside of the city, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, and do not stay anywhere in the valley, but escape to the mountain, or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, Oh no, my lords, but now <coughs> your servant has found favor in your sight. And you have magnified your loving kindness, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, for the disaster will overtake me, and I will die. Now behold, this town is near enough to flee to, that it is small. Please, let me escape there. Is it not small, that my life may be saved? So he, the angel, said to him, Behold, I grant you this request also, to not overthrow the town of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I can do nothing until you arrive there. Therefore the name of the town was called Zor, or Small. The sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zor. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valleys, and all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But his wife from behind him looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Lot's wife dies because she does not listen to instructions, but she dies in an incredibly specific way. God could have killed her in infinite different ways. He chose to kill her by turning her into a, uh, a pillar of salt. Why? Why was that the way that the Lord God chose for Lot's wife to die based on what she did and for that to be recorded in the scriptures for us? Well, salt, beyond being just a seasoning, in this day and time, was the most common way that anyone would preserve food. It was the preservative, especially meats. If you were drying and curing meats, you would salt them so that the salt would draw out the moisture out of the meat. The salt would then replace that moisture with itself, making it really hard for the microbes to ever grow on the meat, so it would last for a long time and be flavored. Salt was the preservative of this time. This is what God is demonstrating to us. If God has showed us that our old life leads to death and that we need to escape it, and we do, whether he has to take us by the hand and nudge us to get us out of our old life, we cannot ever want to preserve any of our old life. Us wanting to preserve the sinful, worldly ways that we lived in before we were Christians, if we try to bring any of that with us or hold on to it, we will die. This is what God is demonstrating to us through this account. In fact, Jesus specifies this in the book of Luke. So go ahead and be turning to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17 in the New Testament, we're going to start reading in about verse 26. Luke 17, and what Jesus is talking about um, is the incoming destruction that's going to be happening to uh, Jerusalem, and Jesus is going to compare all of these sudden destruction events together. Uh, in fact, he's going to be referencing this account. So we'll start in Luke 17, and we're going to start in verse 26. And it says, and just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, 
and they were drinking, and they were marrying, and they were being given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. Here we go. They were eating, and they were drinking. The people in the town of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were buying, and they were selling. They were planting, and they were building. But on the day that the Lord, that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on that day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, the one who is on the housetop and whose goods are in the house must not go to take them back out. And otherwise, and likewise, the one who is in the field must not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. Remember Lot's wife. Her desire to preserve any part of her old life cost her her life. This is what Jesus is saying, is that every time this sudden destruction has been allowed to come upon the earth, we can't hesitate. We can't be pulled in one direction or the other. We either listen and obey God's directions, or we do anything else and we die because of it. Now, what Jesus says really here is very interesting in the Greek. In verse 33, he says, whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. There are three words in Greek that mean life, or the ways that we use the one word life. So the first one is bios. So bios means just living life, right? Like biology. We, we understand that. So if you say, oh, in that swamp, there's a whole bunch of life. There's a whole bunch of, it's teeming with life. Yeah, just living things. That's bios. The second one is what Jesus will often refer to when he says that we need to be striving for eternal life, right? Spiritual life. That is the word zoe. That's that spiritual life. That's the life after this one. It's not biologic life. It's spiritual life, zoe. And then there's the third one. That's what Jesus says here is suke. And that sounds like the base of psychic, psychology, psychiatry, right? Any of those things because it's talking about our mental life, our mental understanding, the picture that we have of life. I'll give you an example of how we use that commonly. When I say, oh, I'm very proud of the life that me and my wife have built together. Well, what is the life that I just said? Right? It's the things we have, it's the people we are, it's the place we live, the cars we drive, like all of those things, the decisions we make, that is that life. This is what Jesus is saying. Whoever seeks to keep his suke, his life that you imagine, that you kind of have your mind wrapped around, whatever defines you, if you try to keep that, you're going to lose your life. But if you willingly lose it, as you become a Christian, as you shed all of the worldly things that were holding us back, that were sending us down the path of death, then we will keep our life, our true life, our spiritual life, our zoe. That's what we want to save, because our bios is going to go. And our suke, everything that defines our life, is also going to go. God's going to destroy it all one day. We need to concentrate on our spiritual life. Now, Jesus is talking here about the destruction of Jerusalem that's going to be coming in 70 AD. And in fact, he specifies more about what that is going to look like and feel like and what is going to precede it. So since we're in Luke, let's turn forward to Luke chapter 21. And we're going to learn a little bit more about this upcoming destruction that Jesus has said is going to be like the days of Noah and the flood and like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah where it just comes suddenly, where people can't hesitate to go back and, oh, I need my favorite cloak, or, oh, I forgot all of my, my money inside of the house. Forget it. Escape with your life. Because this is what's going to happen in Luke 21. We're starting in verse 5. And while some of Jesus' disciples were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, as for these things which you are looking at, this beautiful temple and the architecture and all the surrounding buildings, as for these things, the days will come in which there will not be one stone left upon another which will not be torn down. They questioned him, saying, Teacher, when therefore will these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, See to it that you are not misled. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he. The, the time is near. Do not go after them. 
When you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. Then he continued by saying to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom will rise against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes, and in various places plagues and famines, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. So all of these things are going to proceed the incoming destruction of Jerusalem, which makes it a little tough, right? There's a whole bunch of bad things that are going to be happening that somewhat, some of them happen fairly often. Then he says, verse 12, but before these things, they will lay their hands on you, my disciples, and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and to the prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your mind not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves, for I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. But you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name. Yet not a hair of your hair, uh, not a hair of your head will perish. By endurance you will gain your lives. Here is Jesus talking about the same thing. Your bios is going to die. Your physical life, all of the things that used to define your life, are all going to be taken away. You're going to die, but you are not going to have your <coughs> zoe, your spiritual life, be lost. That's the more important one. You will be gaining your spiritual life. Verse 20, now Jesus answers their question. What's going to be the sign that shows us that Jerusalem's about to get flattened? But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that the time of her desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city, because these are the days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Jesus tells them plainly, all kinds of things are going to happen leading up to this, but when you see armies surrounding Jerusalem, and those would be the Roman legion. Those would be the Roman legions led under General Vespasian. And then later, his son, Titus, would take over for him. They are coming. They're going to sweep through northern Israel. And as they're campaigning down there, they're finally going to arrive at Jerusalem. And when you see those armies coming, it's time to go. That's when you have to just leave. If you hesitate, if you wait, or if you're needing to gather your stuff, it's going to be too late. You're not going to get away. And history tells us that Christians by the thousands listened to Jesus' word, and they got out of Jerusalem as they saw the approaching Roman legion. And the Jews, who had no reason to listen to Jesus, they did not. And Josephus, the Jewish historian who wrote in his, in his book Antiquities of the Jews, estimated that some one million Jews were trapped in Jerusalem and got massacred by the Romans because they did not get out. And yet thousands of Christians had escaped to where John the Baptist was baptizing people, near the Jordan River. They listened. They escaped with their lives. So why are we talking about these physical destructions, Noah and the Ark and the, and the Flood and Sodom and Gomorrah and Jerusalem? Because all of these things are figurative. They are symbolic of the final destruction that's coming. The one that no person can escape. The end of all of our lives. God will end the entire world one day. Let's read about that. Let's go to 2 Peter in chapter 3. Because this is one that we have to be ready for. And just like all of these people in these physical accounts, Noah's Ark and Sodom and Gomorrah and Jerusalem, they got instructions from God. He said, these are the signs. This is what's going to be coming. So here's what you need to do to live. God has done the same thing with the upcoming spiritual destruction. He's given us instructions for what we need to do and things that we need to look out for. So let's read these here. In 2 Peter chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 3 and continue on. Peter saying, Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts. 
and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water, and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved. Now with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any of you to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all of these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Here are the signs of what's going to happen. Did we catch it? Did we catch what Peter said was going to be the signs? In the last days, the mockers are going to come with their mocking saying, what are you doing listening to that religion garbage? Can't you tell us all those fairy tales and it's all made up and nothing's changed? Look, all this time has passed and everything's still the same. Does that sound like anything that we hear today? Does it sound like we are living in the last days, the last age? Because we are. In fact, we have been for 2,000 years. Because the last age is the Christian age. There have been other ages, all kinds of ages throughout time. There's been the patriarchal age with Abraham and others where they were worshiping God and they were given specific directions to. There was the age of Judaism where there was a whole different covenant and different rules. And now it's the Christian age. And this is the last covenant. This is the last age that will ever exist on earth. For how long? We have no idea. That's the thing, is that it will come like a thief in the night. But we know for certain that we are living in the last age. So just like the people who were living in Jerusalem that didn't know when Jerusalem was going to be flattened, should they have just been ready all the time to grab their bug out bags and hit the road, right? All of their prized possessions, everything that they wanted to take with them, they needed to be ready. This is what Peter is saying. You don't know when it's coming, but when it comes... No one's going to have any time to react. So you need to already be ready. This is what he is saying. That in verse 13, because we're looking forward to a new reality, right? Whenever we hear the phrase, a new heavens and a new earth, those aren't literal. This means a new reality. We're looking for a new existence, a new reality. And in verse 14, he says, Therefore, beloved, since we're looking forward to that and knowing that this one, this reality, this existence is going to be torched one day, we need to already be found by him to be in peace, spotless, blameless, regarding the, patient, the patience of our Lord as salvation. Those are our instructions, is that we should already be peaceful and have left these sins behind. All of the things that we used to do in our former worldly walk, we can't ever go back to them. Let's go to uh, the book of 1 Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 5. Peter is going to talk about all of the things that we left behind before we became Christians, before we realized, hey, this stuff is real, and God is real, and that he sent his son to die for me, and I need to spend the rest of my life serving him, and there are things I should no longer be doing. In 1 Peter chapter 4, Let's read the first couple of verses here. So starting in verse 1. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. 
So we need to stop living for the things that attracted us that we were lusting after before and live for God's will. What were some of those things that used to drive our lives? Verse 3. For the time is that already is past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, the desire of the unbelievers, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, abominable idolatries. In all of this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation. Again, drinking and general debauchery. They are surprised that you don't do this anymore, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. These are the things that we can't ever be running back to. We already had our fill of them. This is what Peter is telling us. The time that already passed, the time where you were living in the world, and you were having fun, sinning, and drinking, and practicing all kinds of things that we shouldn't do, don't go back to it. You've had your fill, and guess what? All of those things lead to death, and you know that now. So choose to do better. Choose to walk away from them. The rest of your friends, the rest of the world, they're going to say, well, what do you think? You're better than us now? You're, you're some kind of holy roller? You used to do this stuff with us. Why aren't you doing it now? And it's because we know better now, and we're trying to be better people now. So we stop doing those things. Well, is that going to go over well with them? No. Peter tells us no, because they're going to feel like, oh, man, it feels like I'm, like I'm being judged, like your actions are judging mine, because they are. Because God always looks at two different people in the same situation, and if one does right and the other does wrong, the person who chose to do right, their actions have judged the person who did wrong. Because they also could have done right, just like this other person. And people don't like that feeling. They don't like the ah, it's like it's like an itch or like a like a weird feeling. I don't like it when other people are making me feel bad about doing the sins that I know deep down I shouldn't be doing, so now I'm gonna get mad at you who's making me feel this way. These are the things that we can't ever go back to. Let's look again at Ephesians chapter 4. Sorry, this one didn't make it onto the bulletin list, so you might have to scratch this one in there. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 25, and we're just going to read through chapter 5, verse 5. Uh, it's an, kind of an unfortunate chapter break because this is right in the middle of, of the same uh, statement. But Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 25. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, stop lying. Speak truth to one another, each of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So tell the truth and stop lying. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, and do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with he who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word that is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for in the day of redemption. All of us have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within us if we have been baptized for the forgiveness of our sins, just like Peter promised us in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Don't agree to go back to sinning when you are burying God in your vessel. Don't make him a part of your sinful attitudes. This is what he's saying. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit with what you do. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality, sexual immorality, or impurity of any kind, or greed, must not even be named among you, as is proper among the saints. There must be no filthiness, or silly talk, or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and, in, and with God. 
What are some of those things that we leave behind? We need to leave behind our wrath and our anger and our slander. How many times were words shown to be so important in this list? When we were living in the world, we thought nothing of saying, oh, that person's a so-and-so, and oh, let me tell you what I think about them, or oh, let me share this gossip about what's going on in her life. Words have meaning, and we are going to be judged by every word that we have ever uttered. Don't go back to those filthy words. This is what uh, Paul was writing here. There must be no filthiness or even silly talk or coarse jesting, rough jokes, none of it. Just stay away from all of it. Must not be named among us. Don't go back to the way we used to live when we were just as lost as the rest of the world. Be better. Be a better example. And we may think that some of this is not for us anymore. Um, again, sexual immorality was named, impure persons, covetous, but then he says idolater. I'm like, okay, well, you know what? Not many people are bowing down to a little golden idol anymore. Well, maybe not those little golden ones, maybe not the little stone ones, but are we idolizing all kinds of things and people? And you know what the problem with any idol is? Is that the person we're actually deifying is ourself. Think about that. When I have my little stone or gold idol and I'm saying, oh, great stone idol that I made and I had to set up myself, should I go to the strip club today? Yeah, I think you should. Oh, see, I got it. There, there's my divine instruction. It's me making that decision. It's us wanting to be our own God. Do we think that has disappeared or has that grown even stronger in our current society? Idolatry is us worshiping ourselves as God, despite how many things, how many steps we want to put between that reality and what we do. It's us being our own God, and that is just as strong today. Don't do any of those things. Listen to the true God and obey his word and live the way he is instructing us to live. Because we already have to be ready. That's preparing our bug out bag, right? Our emergency bag. We need to be stuffing that bag with all the righteous deeds that we're doing, with all of our positive attributes and how well we're obeying God. Stuff that bag with those things and don't ever go back into the house for the other things that are going to slow you down and kill you. This is what we need to be doing. The problem is, as we're thinking about those old things that lead to our death, all of those things happen in the past, or at least they should have happened in our past. And the problem with any time we remember the past is that we remember the past very well. Let's actually look at a couple examples of this in Numbers chapter 11. And we're going to talk a little bit more about why we always seem to remember the past as better than what it was. The past is comfortable for us because it's something that we already know how it ended, what happened, how those things went for us. And humans, despite lists saying that public speaking is the number one fear of humans, or that death is the second fear of humans, or you know, claustrophobia, or any of those other things, the thing that all of humans fear the most is the unknown. That is what all of us fear more than anything. And that's why it's so easy for us to slip back into old habits or back into an old way of life is because, well, I know how that went. And, you know, oh, this Christian thing, I don't, I don't know how that's going to go. I feel uncomfortable not knowing what the future holds here. But, oh, my old sinful life, like an old derby glove, yeah, I know that that fits pretty well. And the problem is the more we think about our old life and how comfortable it was or how aware of where it went was for us, that can lead us to start not appreciating what God is offering us and the new life that we have. So I said, let's turn to Numbers chapter 11, and we're going to look at verses 18 through 20. What's going on here? The Jews have escaped Egypt. They are wandering through the desert. They've been out there for about a year at this point. God has been giving them manna from heaven, so they're breaking it into bread each morning. He's giving them water from a rock to keep them hydrated as they're walking. Their sandals aren't wearing out, their clothes aren't wearing out, but they have had to leave Egypt. So let's listen to what the people are complaining about in verses four and five. In uh, Numbers 11, four, the rabble who were among them had greedy desires. Listen to how that's said, greedy desires. For the sons of Israel wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? 
Remember, they're just eating bread every day, the bread that God is raining down out of heaven, that they're baking the manna. We remember the fish that we used to eat free in Egypt, and the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. But now our appetite is gone. There is nothing at all to look at except this manna. What are they doing? They're remembering the past. They're remembering their old life. But they're remembering only the good parts. Isn't that a little strange? No, because that's what we do all the time. Actually, scientists had to study this because there's such an asymmetry in how we remember the past versus the present that when the researchers at MIT finally conducted research about this, we realized that humans are much faster <coughs> to shed any negative memory that we have. Anything that was painful or harmful, we get rid of it. Because obviously, why would we want to keep it? Why would we expend mental energy holding on to something that's painful? We get rid of those. We keep the good things, which that means every time we think about the past and we remember things, we're basically only remembering the good parts of the past because we have scrubbed our memory of all of the bad things. There's a reason that the sayings of, oh, they don't make them like they used to, or, oh, movies were better back in the day, and, oh, this was better back in the day. Yeah, and sometimes that is true. But the fact is we're always going to think that the past is better than the present because as we're considering the present, we consider the good and the bad that are happening. We weight those both equally because they're fresh. But when we think about the past, we think about only the good things. Look at what they're saying. We remember the fish that we used to eat free, the cucumbers and the melons, garlic, onions. Yeah, you know what you don't remember? Being a slave. The fact that you were owned by other people, the fact that the Egyptians were working you to death and beating you if you didn't make enough bricks, and the fact that the Egyptians were making you throw your babies into the Nile River because they didn't want there to be any more of you. The fact that the Egyptians even took the amount of straw that they were giving you as you were making these bricks and then beat you if you didn't make as many as you used to with the straw. The fact that you were broke and had no hope, that you had no future, you owned nothing. We're not remembering any of that. We're just focusing on the one thing that we enjoyed that we've lost. Look at where that leads them. Drop down to verse 18. This is God speaking to Moses, by the way. Say to this people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Oh, that someone would give us meat to eat. And here is the other part that wasn't captured earlier that they were saying, because God's not lying. He can't lie. He says, I have heard you saying, for we were well off in Egypt. Were you? That's incredible. Look at all those things that we just talked about. Were you well off in Egypt? But you're focusing on the one thing that you don't have now. God made them free. When they walked out of Egypt, God gave them all kinds of silver and gold. The Egyptians were throwing money at them to get them out of the country. He's feeding and watering them every day. They're on their way to a country that God is giving them where they didn't even have to build the houses or harvest all of the sheep or the herds. All of those things were already done for them. They just had to move in. And they're willing to trade all of that for meat, for the memory of the melons and the onions and the garlic. And God says in verse 19, you shall eat not for one day or two days or five days or 10 days, nor 20 days, but a whole month until it comes out your nostrils, until it becomes loathsome to you because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wept before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? All right, now let's skip it down ahead again. And let's see as God gives them this meat, as he blows an entire flock of quail around them. And this quail settles in by the sea, and the, the people spend the next day. Verse 32. The people spent all day and all night and all the next day and gathered the quail. He who gathered the least gathered ten homers of quail, and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. While the meat was still between their teeth, before it was chewed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord struck the people with a very severe plague. Did God take kindly to them, wanting and lusting after the thing that they had lost in their past, their sinful, worldly lives that were going to lead to death? No. He did not take kindly to it because he killed those that were complaining about not having it. 
the ones that were lusting about, the ones that were thinking about going back to that life because they wanted that meat so bad, God killed them for even considering that. This is what we have to keep in mind as we're thinking about the past that we left behind. We all have left worldly and sinful lives. We might think about some of those things and like, oh yeah, I remember that, and that was good, or like, oh, that was a fun time. But was it? Those things were leading us to our death. Keep the greater picture in mind that don't forget, yeah, when you were drinking and partying with, with Bob and with Sheila and everything was, was really fun that night, you had no hope. You were on the path to death and fire forever and ever. Keep all of the picture in mind and don't ever want to go back to that life, but stay strong and want to keep living lives for God. This is why we have the example of Lot's wife. This is why anytime somebody who wants to preserve some of their past will lose their future life for doing so. Let's read our final uh, verse today. We're going to go to 2 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to be looking at how God, through Peter, describes what it looks like to him whenever we choose to go back to our old, sinful, disgusting lives. If we ever fall back into those habits and fall back into them so hard that we walk away from the faith. Right? That's the worst thing that can happen to a Christian is that you are saved, you come to a knowledge of the truth, you escape all of that, and then you start thinking about the past, and like, oh, well, this part was really fun, and man, I wish I could do that again, or like, oh, now I have to do that again, and you go back to it, and then you never come back. You fall back into sin and your old lifestyle. In 2 Peter chapter 2, let's read verses 20 through 22. This is what Peter's talking about. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. All right, so plain English, if we leave, if we have all of our sins forgiven and we stop living that worldly life and then we fall back into it and we forsake the Christian life, our fate at the end of time will be worse than if we had never learned about God in the first place. Let's read more. Verse 21. For it would have been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn away from the holy commandment handed to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. How stupid does God see that decision? How disgusting does he see that decision? It's like the dog that ate something that made it sick, that realized I shouldn't be eating that, throws up, and then walks back over and eats its own throw up. Right? It is disgusting, and it's dumb. It's the same as a pig. If you wash it off and you clean it off, then it goes back to wallowing in its pig mire, which is feces and mud and water and partially digested food and rotting food and all of this. That's what it's soaking itself back in because it's comfortable. Being clean wasn't comfortable. This is new for me, so I'm going to go back into my old comfortable memories. This is what we can never do. Because as Peter warns us, as God through Peter is warning us, if we do that, it will be worse for us than if we had never known God. And the passage that I had Harold, wherever Harold's sitting, um, the passage that I had Harold read this morning tells us what's going to happen to those people who've never known God. Jesus is going to come back with his angels in flaming fire, and that is going to be their end, is that they are all going to be sent down into the lake of fire forever, and it's going to be worse than that. I can't even comprehend how it could be worse than being in a lake of fire forever, but you know what I do believe? I believe that nothing is impossible for God, and when he says something, I believe him. So when he says it's going to be worse, it will be worse. Let go of the past. Don't let it entangle you again and start sucking you down into our old sinful lifestyles. Be better than your old you. Be the new you. Live for Christ instead of for yourself. 
Now, if there is anyone here today that is still living for themselves, that hasn't allowed the blood of Christ through baptism to wash away all of their sins, we can help you with that today. We invite you to come down and decide to put on Christ through baptism. If there's any other way that the church can help you today, if you need prayers, if you need encouragement, if there's anything, we invite anyone who has a need of any kind, we invite you to come down to the front. I'm going to be standing right up here as Jim prepares to lead us as we stand and sing our invitation song.
always strengthen us and give us the, the courage to stand up and be the voice of reason and to, to, to always, always let your light shine. And to never, never go back to where we came, but always move forward in, in, our, in our faith and our trust in you. We ask you, God, to, to be with those mentioned before, Lord, and just continue to heal those who need it and, and comfort comfort those who are grieving and just pray, Lord, that you, you give them that peace and let them let them find solace in, in your love and your joy. We ask you, Lord, to, to be with us as we partake of the meal downstairs and we just ask you, Lord, to bless that meal and to bless our bodies to your service. We pray this in Jesus' name.